NFTs have made a big splash in the art and music world. Artists such as Grimes, Steve Aoki, and Kings of Leon all getting into the non-fungible token world with video and record releases. And our next guest recently penned an NBC op-ed on NFTs and what he calls an entirely new frontier for the music industry. Let's bring in Mikel Jolet, the lead singer of the Airborne Toxic event and a New York Times best-selling author for his memoir, Hollywood Park. Mikel, great to have you with us. Oh, thanks for thanks for having me today. Uh, Mikhail, you speak our language. You say music is underpriced right now. And I'm wondering if you think NFTs are a way to remedy that solution, that the problem. Well, I think I think that's part of it. I think the main thing is that NFTs are harbingers of something else. And I think that this idea that NFTs are going to somehow be the panacea that changes music, I think is a little overinflated. Um, but it's more that they represent uh, something else. I don't think we're suddenly all going to get into the fine art business and be like Beeple and sell a record for you know $69 million or something. I think it's more that we're talking about a new frontier uh, with NFTs and we're seeing the leading edge of it in art and music. And that new frontier is sort of, I guess you could say the internet of value, um, which is uh, functionally different from the internet of say social media, the e-commerce internet. Uh, and that is something massive and there are a lot of applications for all kinds of IP, including you know fine art and music and many other things. but also many other industries. Uh, and also, I, I kind of feel like part of it's just the promise of the Internet was always that you could, you know, disintermediate major corporations between artists and fans. That's what we were always told. And then, uh, you know, at each point that the music industry has been disrupted, that wasn't that wasn't true. And I think we might finally be knocking on the door of that, but perhaps not for the reason it seems everybody thinks. Yeah, the point that you make is that so many times there have been these disruptors that come on the scene and do change the mm -hmm. way things um, get done in the music industry, and yet right. it's not to the artist's advantage. advantage. Napster, LimeWire, yeah. iTunes, now Spotify. Yeah. NFTs are going to be different, you think? I do. You make a good point. It's like at each point they were like, okay, it's not going to be soul-sucking anymore. We're not going to just have the corporations taking the profits anymore. That was what, you know, Napster was going to do that. The internet itself was going to do that. MP3s were going to do that. iTunes was going to do that. Spotify was going to do that. And then at each point, they just found like a new way for it to be sort of soul sucking for artists and to put corporations uh, in, in the driver's seat of profits in the industry, which famously go, I think something like 88% of profits in the industry go to corporations, not to artists. And, you know, so it's, it's like creative ways of taking advantage of starving artists who are sort of expected to be to continue to starve. So, Mikkel, you know, obviously you just made the case how, um, you know, technology, the Internet in particular, has not made it easier for artists. But, you know, with COVID now, um, all of a sudden, you know, you guys were making a lot of money touring. It was one area where you could actually kind of flex a little bit. How do you think about NFTs kind of disrupting that part of the music industry when we get back to touring, which is going to come probably pretty soon this summer? It's a great concrete example of why ownership matters and why smart contracts and things in this sort of internet of value matter. So right now, if you're a band that goes on tour and you sell out a venue that's got a thousand seats, right? Then what happens is once it's sold out, a bunch of people go on StubHub um, and they take some of those seats. Maybe they're the front row seats. Maybe they're the best seats. And they put them on sale for, let's say, three times. Let's say you sold it for 50 bucks and they put them on StubHub for 300 bucks. Right now, all that value is going to StubHub and it's going to the scalper and none of it's going back to the artist. If you made the ticket itself a token, if you tokenize it, you put it on the blockchain, you encrypted it, and let's say you just made it a QR code, you can build into it something called a smart contract. So every time it's sold, you can set what percentage goes back to the originator of the contract. In this case, it would be the band. So I could say, uh, you know, and people did this, say, with his art contracts, he made it 10%. Every time it resells, you get 10%. With a ticket, you could say 80%. You could say 60%. And so they say, fine, I'm going to take it. I'm going to put it on StubHub for 300 bucks. Great. That's the, then StubHub gets some money and the, art, and the scalper gets some money. But in this instance, then now that artist gets 60% of that inflated value of that ticket. Whereas right now, he doesn't get any of it. Yeah. Injustice there, for sure. Mikhail, thanks so much for joining us. We hope you'll, you'll come back. Yeah, thanks for having me. Mikhail Jolet. Um, so we got music lovers, we got music makers on this panel. Tim, I'll go to you on, on what you think NFTs could mean. Well, Mikhail's right. I mean, the value that music plays in our life and, and, and what it does and how it changes our life is worth a lot more than pennies uh, per streaming. And that, you know, the, the biggest artists who are, you know, 1% are the ones that get 80% of these flows um, or more. So, um, look, I, I like the fact that you're creating unique experiences also and that you're creating uh, something that's unique. Look, 
music fans are also collectors. Uh, and I think they're willing to give a lot more back to the band to have that kind of a, what feels like an intimate personal co connection. I, I love the ticket idea. Like, I, I hate the fact that I'm, um, I'm, getting, I'm getting whacked at StubHub and I know someone on the other side is also getting whacked and no one else is seeing it but them. So there's a much to be improved. The, the disservice charges that you get tacked on by every ticket agency, and we know who they are, um, it's just not fair. And so fans and artists alike want to see this change. Um, just quickly, Karen, you're an investor in Live Nation. Good or bad? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. I was thinking about that. You know, when he's talking about going on tour, can they, can Live Nation help their artists sort of chop up parts of their concert and make NFTs out of them and sell them to, you know, the highest bidder? And could that be an additional revenue stream that is nowhere in, in Live Nation's model? What is in Live Nation's model is Ticketmaster. And to the extent that the dynamic that Tim talked about is decreased, that's not good for Live Nation. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.